Okay, so we've got 47 or so people. So we'll kick off and we'll just let people join as they come along. I'm going to share my screen because as always, this is being run pretty much solely on mural. Um, we were going to do a proper icebreaker, but there's a few too many people um, and we've got stuff to get through. So what I'm gonna do is introduce myself, get Adrian to introduce himself, um, and then if there's anyone else who would like to do an intro, please raise your hand and we'll, we'll happily go through. Um, so I'm Dr. J. Um, I've got, I use they as a pronoun. Um, I, I work as a consultant. Uh, I'm a service designer business analyst type and I work for ThoughtWorks and I'm currently working for the Department for Transport on the SnapTan project. So I'm the person trying to understand the big picture of how everything fits together um, as well as helping the team understand how the smaller pictures and the smaller pieces all slot to make everything work for everybody. Adrian, would you like to do a quick intro? Yeah, hi, my name's Adrian Falconer. I'm the product owner for uh, the Naptan redevelopment. So everything concerning um, our, our work to recreate the, the Naptan product. Uh, and it's, it's my role to um, balance the needs of um, the users of Naptan against um, Jay's crazy ideas for what's potential, potentially possible. Um, and, and add a dose of reality <laughs> and, and delivery, sorry, to, to, to those to those <laughs> ideas. My ideas are not crazy. They're 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 based on seeing Sorry, what people are yes. doing and trying to think of new ways and new potential around it. Um, I'll just if anyone wants to do an intro, feel free to put your hand up. Otherwise, we'll we'll truck along, and I'll run through what we're going to cover today. Fantastic. So in the next two hours or so, we're going to go through what the scope is. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of time to put some feedback on the scope once we've talked it through. We're going to talk about what we've understood from the different public meetings we've held and how that's um, changed and firmed up some of our thinking and what we're going to start looking at. Um, I'm going to go through where we are now, showing some of the stuff that's coming up in the alpha. Um, which we, we're going to start testing. We're going to talk about some of the help that we need from you as well. We've got some, some small things that we need to sort out. Um, and then I'm going to give you a section for giving your feedback on all the different work that we've done uh, in these public consultations and everything, just to kind of let us know whether we're doing the right things, what other things you'd like us to do and things like that. And then I'll run through the contacts and everything. So the scope. Now, some of you got to see this at a couple of the public meetings last month, um, but I thought it was really good to run through it again and just make sure that everyone was clear where we're at. So if you click on number two, you'll come along to an area about scope with uh, uh, three horizons, horizon one, horizon two, horizon three, and within horizon one, there's three releases. So hopefully everyone can can see and follow me. So for release one, which is what we're currently working on, this is what we've called almost, it's not quite a minimum viable product because it's a little bit more than the minimum, but we're talking about in, in release one, these are the things that we're focusing on to try to set ourselves up for being able to move people across. Because what we're needing to do is to run two systems in parallel for, for a little bit. Current Naptan or old Naptan and new Naptan. I think we're going to call them current and new. It's probably going to be the way if we call it old Naptan, it might feel a little bit ageist and uh, feel like we're being mean to old Naptan. So we're going to call it current Naptan and new Naptan. Um, so I'll explain some of the things around how those two fit together. So what we've got under release one, we've got three different types of users and the kind of story of that we're going to support for them. So we've got somebody who is a consumer of Naptan data. And the, what they want to do is they want to download Naptan data anonymously so that they can maintain their database of public transport access points. So this is looking at anyone who might be downloading data to put into their database or their consumer app or whatever they're trying to build. The second person that we're kind of looking at is somebody who looks very much like Adrian, 
Um, as DFT manager responsible for publishing the data, I want to have a publicly available site, so a site anyone can access that's of the right standard so that we know that we're publishing data responsibly. And the third one is um, looking at somebody like Ursuline or Alex, who are currently supporting NAPTAN. As a DFT employee responsible for supporting the NAPTAN users, I want to see, I want to proactively manage issues with stability and access on the site so I can give the best service for our users. So that's what we're looking at in this first release. We're setting up just being able to download and you'll and now the question should come up in everyone's mind if you're downloading data where are you getting your data from and I'll quickly explain that using my hands hopefully people can see me and in fact what I might do is just pin myself for a second spotlight me spotlight so you should all now be able to see my hands if this is current NAPTAN here and this is new NAPTAN here we're taking the data that you're uploading to current NAPTAN and we're copying it down and we're running it through the services to create the output in new NAPTAN. Now those services should should create an identical system and if they if they're not creating identical data we will understand exactly what's going different. Does that make sense to everybody that we're that you're still uploading to current NAPTAN and we're copying the data from where you're uploading it down and we're running it through the new system and, and coming up with an output from there. Does this hopefully this has made a lot of sense to everybody. Uh, feel free to put your hand up and interrupt me. I see Alison's given me a thumbs up. Thank you very much. That's that's lovely to see. I will unspotlight myself. Um, so that's that's release one. Release two is starting to look at how we do uploads. Oop, uh, Lee, you've got a question. Uh, yeah, sorry, apologies. I'm behind the curve um, with this. So in one sentence, could you just tell me what 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 is we're trying to achieve with the new NAPTAN? Because I'm 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 behind I'm I'm not up to speed with it, so apologies. No problems whatsoever. Um current NAPTAN um is not that stable, is quite slow and is stuck in 2.1. We can't upgrade it, we can't do any changes to it. So what we're doing with new NAPTAN is we're trying to create something that's stable, that's fast and that can use all sorts of new data standards. So it's flexible enough to understand all the different schemas that, that could come into it and to output data much better. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a whole pile of other, oh, bear with me here, two seconds, my door is knocking and I'm the person home. Adrian, would you like to fluster for a moment while I go and answer the door? <laughs> um, okay, I'll, I'll move us on to release two. Um, the key bits around release two um, are the next steps um, that, that we want to. I'm trying to move the screen and I can't because Jay's presenting. Um, there's two main bits that we're looking at in release two, and so that's looking at identity and upload. Um, and Jay's back, so I'll stop talking. But I was talking about identity <laughs> and upload. Oh, excellent. Um, so, what we need to do to get people to be able to upload. We need to be able to identify you. We need to know who you are and where you're able to upload for. So that's one of the pieces that we need to build in there. And it's one of the pieces that we can also build in there around identity is that you could save your downloads. You can save your preferences for download. This is very like this is very much like what there is now. But we want to do it with a little bit more extensibility. So these identities could be used in other places. We can use them in a way that we can make sure that we know that these accounts are being used. We know that we are taking a wild guess from rumour that some of you may have had your accounts for many, many years, and maybe the person on that account whose name, whose account is being used to upload might not have been around for a while or I may have left the department, but we're, we're still using their account to log on to NAPTAN. Not saying that that's wrong, not saying nothing about that, but we're aware that there's some of some of that that still goes on on the system. So we're wanting to make sure that we know who's there and we understand 
and we've got a nice life cycle. We also want to make it easier to manage your accounts. So that's one of the things that we need to start looking at. So this is all in release two. It's about uploading. So instead of having old NAPTAN and copying the data across, we'll be starting to get people onto putting their data onto new NAPTAN. And we'll do some more things around what sort of outputs come out. And then release three and possibly release and, and onwards, we're still trying to figure out exactly what we're going to do. So when I built this, we thought release three would be based solely around bringing NubTig across uh, MPTG. Um, because currently, current NAPTAN holds both NAPTAN data and NubTig data. Now, one of the questions we've got is, do we need to bring NubTig data across? If we take NAPTAN away from the current server, is it going to be stable enough and fast enough? And NubTig data is updated so rarely, can that just sit there and we'll do something to improve the NAPTAN data and the NAPTAN experience? So we've got a couple of questions that we're trying to answer around what's going to happen there. And this is where your feedback is really, really important to us because we want to understand what the best pieces are for us to do. What's going to make your world light up and what's going to be really great? What's going to help you in your job? Because we don't want to do anything that's going to make your job worse. You've not got the time, you've not got the money, you've not got the people. We don't want you have to have to struggle with systems as well. Um, so that's what's in release three. And then in horizon two, so this is looking a little bit further out. These are the sort of things that we are thinking about and starting to have a look at. So this is the stuff that I'm starting to research to uncover what it might be and when should we bring it in? How should we order it? And take these ideas to Adrian and to the department to go and go, we need to do this and here's the reasons why and here's the sort of changes that it will make to the NAPTAN world. And here's the sort of stuff that will rock their world or not rock their world. And this is things like switching off the old site, um, going for a big schema change. We're, everyone's currently NAP10 currently only really does 2.1 on current NAP10. Now, if we can take two, up to 2.5 data, should we help everyone move to 2.5? Should we move everyone to 2.4? Because that's what some of you are already providing. And we'll then figure out what we do from there. Are there changes that need to be made to the schemas to make them work? We know that there are some redundant fields like clearance code because the technology for, for clearing the code as the bus drives away no longer exists, but that field is still within the, within the schema. Do we make some changes to remove some of those redundant fields? Um, this also comes back to the accessibility point around bringing the accessibility data in. Now, we know that 2.5 did a whole pile of work around accessibility. But that was almost 10 years ago now. And we know that the ideas around accessibility and what's needed have changed a little bit in that time, especially for non-visible non -visible impairments. So things like cognitive um, and neuro, uh, I'm having a moment, neuronormativities around autism and, and things like that. So how do we, how do we make things more accessible for people and how do we record that in our systems? And that's one of the big questions that we've got to answer as a group. Um, there's a little bit around, well, there's a lot around visualization. I'll talk about why we've uncovered why that's quite so important. How we visualize the stops matters and also how precise we need to be. If we're starting to think about self-drive vehicles, what precision is going to be required for a self-drive vehicle to know where a bus stop is compared to a human walking along the street? Because me walking along the street with, within a couple of metres is, is, is totally fine. I can adjust to it. For somebody driving along the road, a couple of metres is pretty fine. People can adjust to it. For a self-drive vehicle, it's got to be much, much more precise and accurate. So it's got to be in the right place and precisely in the right place. So how do we m make adjustments for that and how do we map that? Um, do, do we need to create an API? 
so an API is kind of like a computer language where the two computers can talk to each other and it means that we can get the data from NAPTAN or we can put data into NAPTAN without having to go through the website or anything like that. And it also means we can start to do, we should be able to do deltas or changes. So I can say, has anything changed today? Give me all the changes that have been added in to NAPTAN today. Which means instead of having to upload all of your data, you should be able to only upload, oh, I've changed this one stop. Here's the data for the one stop that I've changed. And know that that's not going to overwrite all of your data. So it's the ability to do things like that comes in when we build an API. And there will be other things. And that's why I've put the question marks there, because I'd like people to think about what might be the other things that go in there. And you're like, OK, so this is all great. I've got these horizons. Where does this lead to? And this is the 2025, although that could be earlier or could be later vision of having public transport planning. We've got accessibility information. We've got all types of stops within areas. We've got data uploaders being able to put in ferry and rail. Um, you can do it from third party tools or a web API. You can only put in updates. All of the different um, DFT open data sets are available. There's some kind of centralized account system, perhaps. Um, conflicts between databases are really easy to see. If you add or remove a bus stop and it was going to conflict with something on BODS, you could be notified, hey, this is going to create cause a conflict on BODS. Do you, which database do you want to correct? Do you want to correct NAPTAN or do you want to go correct BODS and fix, and fix this issue? Um, there's new data standards, the support for the support is retired for older schemas, so we move everyone onto the same schemas. Um, there's validation against a clear set of business rules and business rules I'll come to talking a bit more about in, at the moment. And there's fewer false positives. When we do anything with the data, when we do any data checks, we, we know exactly what's going on. Um, then we've got our DFT department sitting down the bottom here and they have a common login across all of the DFT managed sets. There's consistent support from them. There's APIs working within DFT that allows conflicts to be managed. The policy operations and support teams are all working together as a consolidated team across this open data set. So we've not got pieces moving un in an uncoordinated way. Everything's coordinated and moving together. I know that's a shocker. Um, and then we come to the data downloaders or the data consumers who are building consumer apps. And I've used City Mapper or Google or any kind of any other mapping software that takes the NAPTAN data and uses it. And there's also the ecosystem apps, which is what a lot of people are using to maintain their bus stop assets, to plan their bus routes to plan their rail stations and things like that, um, even planning their street works. And the goal of all of this, as we all know, is increased public transport usage. So I'm going to take a breath there for a second because that's been a long monologue. Um, hopefully it's made some sense. If you've got any thoughts, put your hands up. Um, if you want to write your thoughts down, you will be able to put stickies on here. So please feel free to put stickies and let us know what you think is a great idea. Let us know what you think is not a great idea. Let us know what you think is a terrible idea that we should never do. Um, and, and let us know if there's stuff that we've missed, if there's thinking that we, that we haven't done here. And don't worry if you can't think of anything right now. Um, we're going to leave this board open for you to comment on. Uh, Dan. Uh, hi, everyone. I was wondering at what stage on head are we looking at improving the actual data? This is all about access to the data, but actually the data itself, such as standardizing naming conventions and things like that as part of as part of NAPTAN. I will come to that. That to me fits under the business rules um, and I'm going to talk about the business rules um, as we come along because there is some complications shall we say 
cool. So what I'm going to do now is, is I'm going to go on to uh, section three, which is about what we've found out at the different public meetings. So hopefully this will help us and we I'm more than happy to come back to the scope and to kind of recover any of this if, if any questions pop up in people's minds. So if you press on the number three, we'll, we'll go up and we'll have a look at what we uncovered from the public meetings. And Dan, you'll be pleased to know business rules is at the top of that list. So just for clarity, there's two types of checks that are done on the data when it comes into NAPTAN. The first one is checking it against the XML schema. So this makes sure make sure that it matches all the requirements of the schema. It's got the required fields, they're of the right length, they're of the right type and things like that. Then there's a set of business rules which do some comparisons between fields to make sure if this field's set to this, then these fields need to be set like this, or they set out rules that say this field shouldn't contain these sorts of words and pieces like that. Now, what we're trying to do is to, we've decoupled those quite a lot in the new NAPTAN that we're building. So we've got, we're currently able to test against the schemas and make sure that anything, any data that's provided is valid against the right schema. And we can even do up to schema 2.4. Sarah's going to nod at me that we can do 2.4, can't we, Sarah? Oh, yeah, good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, that means that we can take and store all the all of that different data. So what, what we are looking at here with the business rules is those rules about data quality that sit outside of the schema. Now, we went and found 131 of them documented in all kinds of places. Uh, this is documented within the schema, documented within Open NAPTAN, documented within the system, documented within ETO World, and everywhere that we could find business rules, we sat down and we wrote them out. What we did then was we grouped them by what sort of rule they were. So we had a couple of different groupings and we had three in some of the public meetings, people will remember, I showed you different business rule types and asked you which ones are more important and less important. And what we came up with were three top business rule types, which was about ACTO code, location, and common name. No surprises there whatsoever for, for, for anybody. In fact, if anyone's surprised, I'd be surprised. Using the business rules from those three, we started to pull out and we started to look at the top 10 business rules we love. So we took, there were like 13 business rules that came out of those top three groups and we started to stack them around and have a look at which of those business rules were actually providing value, which ones were providing confusion and complication, which ones were duplicates of each other. Um, there was a couple that, that were about the different meters away from a bus stop and a signage and things like that. And it was a difference between 50, 100 and 250 meters. So we kind of group those together because we know that those are about location. What we've uncovered is there's quite a bit more research that we need to do about how we would implement some business rules. And then once we've done that, we'll need to come back and have a look at what those business rules should be. And this is a mixture between the location of the bus stop, the bearing of the bus stop, and the common name slash street name of the bus stop. Because if you get the location wrong, then you're going to get the bearing and the street name checks wrong. If you get the street name checks wrong, it can get you, it will create all sorts of issues around the naming. And if you get if you think you're on the wrong street, well, then you're never going to get the bearing right. So there's kind of three that loop around, although the location is kind of the key that holds the other two together. So this means that we need to start doing some a lot more research and understanding exactly what we mean by location of a bus stop. What data you're currently providing? What data we've been calculating from what you've currently been providing? And how we should best map that because how we best map that will give us a little bit better on the street names and the reason i'm saying this is we all know the problem or we've most of us many of us have the problem of there being two streets that are kind of side by side for a bit with the bus stop and if the bus stops slightly in the wrong place the 
the system will decide which street it's on. And if it decides it's on the wrong street, then it will make mark the street name as wrong. And it's not that the street name is wrong. It's that some somehow it's got the location wrong. So there's some questions there whether we use unique street reference numbers to indicate exactly what streets a bus stop is on when we're in that situation. How do we how do we make the system think about this in a much better way? Also, which map should we use? OpenStreetMap, Google Maps, another mapping system, ordinance surveys, which which mapping system we use is going to make a big difference here. So that's some big decisions that we need to sit down and make and come and talk to you about. And I'll talk to you more about how we're going to do that. Does this make sense for the first set of business rules? And Dan, did this answer your question about when we're looking at data quality? Right, now I'm going to move on to the next one. <laughs> um, for those who didn't, who weren't aware, I managed to hold a two hour meeting on CSV files alone and on one particular CSV file alone, um, which um, various people have found quite quite hilarious given my level of technical knowledge. Um, so what we started to do is currently CSV files are provided as a zip file to you. And we were trying to understand, is there value in us doing all 16 files first off? Do we have to do that big bit of work or can we just do a piece of it and still give you the data that you need? So we had a look through, unpacked what was inside that, C that zip file and asked people which of the CSV files everyone used. And we found that there were three that are commonly used. We know that stops.csv everybody uses. It is the, the CSV file that is used by everybody. Then the stop areas and plus zones are the other two files that seem to be used by everybody. Everything else is a subset of stops.csv or one of the other two. So it was very much how do we how do we balance this out? Now we're not going to change the standard. This is the order in which we release things. We want to make sure that we do the valuable stuff first so that we can test stuff out and get you to test it out with some real data that you can actually go off and use. So a very, very easy decision was that we use stops.csv as the first thing that we deliver in our alpha. So this is the minimum viable product. We know that if we give you stops.csv, it's something that you can go off and use. You can test it. You can tell us if we've broken stuff. Um, you can tell us if it if it's if the system's going to work, if downloading it's going to work for you. You can do all of that testing. Um, and we've given you something useful. And then we can start to build in some of the others. Does this make sense to everybody? And do people understand why we've made this kind of decision? Is it going to make anyone cry, especially people like Rob and other people who are making the the, the software or, or uploading this data into their software? Hopefully this is not going to make you cry if we do stops.csv first. Cool. The next thing that we moved on to, and I don't, I'm opening the door, but I don't really want to walk through it at the moment on school bus, school bus stops because we need to do some more work on it, is around the bus stop life cycle. So we know that putting in a bus stop is not just the bus. It, we, we defined a bus stop. A bus stop is where the bus stops. Um, we know that in some places this can be a custom stop, which is just a patch of grass by the side of the road. In many places, this requires a pole. This requires some safety check on the highways to make sure that it's situated in a safe place, that if the bus stops, it can get back out again. Um, it's not stuck in there. It doesn't have to try to reverse out. It's got a, a, a way to drive out. Um, cars can pass it. It's safe for passengers to hop off. It's safe, safe for passengers to wait there. All of those things need to happen. Um, one of the things that we have uncovered is because of all the work that you have to do to put in a bus stop, bus stops are never really removed from NAPTAN. So once you've put a bus stop into NAPTAN, NAPTAN's like the least of your worries with the poles and the furniture and the situations and it moving. It will always seems to remain in NAPTAN. Now we know there are some deleted stops or some archive stops, but they're very, very few and far between. 
this means that some of the things that need to happen around school bus stops is part of a new bit of research that we need to do. And this comes back to, do we need to make some changes to the schema? Is the way that we're gonna, the way that everyone's thinking about doing school bus stops, can we align everyone so that we all kind of do it more or less in the same way? And if there's a better way of doing it, is it about allowing a, a type of stop called school in the schema and it's got slightly different rules to it that makes it not not so publicly visible but not public not personally identifiable for some of the problems that people are trying to solve so that's some of the research that we need to go off and do hopefully this makes sense i'm just going to stop and take a breath again if anyone wants to let me know if there's any other complications we need to think about here richard uh, you've gone back on mute. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Hi, Dr. J. I, I, I think the, there's a lot of your talk has been about um, buses, uh, and that time when it was first created was much more about all modes of transport. Is there, is there still a, a desire for it to be a multimodal? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, okay. It is. It is completely multimodal. The reason we're focusing on bus stops is they are 90 something, and I can't remember whether it's two, five or eight percent, because I can't do maths that quickly in my head, but it's 90, high 90 something percentage of all of the stops within NAPTAN are bus stops. So we're focusing on getting them right, because then we can go and fix up the other ones. Now, the, the centrally held ones, these are the ones that are maintained by Department for Transport. So this is ferries, airports, rail, trams. Now, we want to look at, should Department for Transport be looking after the tram stops, or should somebody like TFL be able to look after the Croydon tram stops and Manchester be able to look after the Manchester tram stops, or do they have to continue coming through DFT? So there's little things that we want to start looking at around those and making that a little bit more sensible for everybody and a little bit more usable. Um, and that's some of the complications. If you have a look under Horizon 2, you'll see there's some very complicated scenarios that I've tried to create. Um, and we're trying to understand a lot about bus boundaries and bus control boundaries and things like that. I see, see Richard nodding, so I'm assuming I've got it right. Um, the next thing that we've moved on to is naming rules. Everyone is doing things slightly differently. And this is because I believe 20 years ago, there was some kind of agreement as to how names should work. And over the last 20 years and trying to make things work for your local authority, your local people, your local buses, things have you've everyone's made little decisions i'm going to do this with a name or i'm going to put the the um the dun cow which is a pub down on the old kent road um is now called another stop um old kent road tesco's is now called dunton road but it's still occasionally listed as old kent road test known as old kent road tesco's and if you search for old kent road tesco's it'll still it'll refer you to dunton road so it's how do you find how do you store those slightly alternative names and places how do you set up your stop areas and your localities in a way that allows us to stack things hierarchically programmatically as well so we can say where, where are you trying to get? Or is the mapping software good enough to do most of that locality stuff itself? Do we need to tell it that this bus stop is in this locality? Or do we just say, I want to head somewhere near this locality and the mapping software goes, oh yeah, it's within this geo boundary and here's all the bus stops that, that kind of match that. Because in the last 20 years, technologies moved in slightly different ways. So how do we handle things like that? So there's reasons that things have gone weird. Dave, David, I can't remember if you're a Dave or a David, sorry. Uh, yeah, I answer, I answer uh, to either. Um, yeah, I think it, I think this is the, this is the kind of one my, my book bears because um, of something that could be improved. Um, and I've been trying to really nail over the course of these sessions, what it is that, um, what's missing really. Um, or how to be improved as a data consumer. 
because I've been all through all the rules of how these names of the different attributes are supposed to work and how they could be combined and what the intention is. And as I read them all, I realize they're all really rules for creators. They're all rules for the people creating the data to say it should be populated in this way. You know, a valid field for this, a uh, valid you know value for this field is this. Um, I think if there's something that might be missing that would help creators and consumers, it's are the clear rules for con the consumers of this data. And after an awful lot of research, I'm kind of concluding that there aren't. Um, whenever I look at a stop and I look at it uh, in three, four, five different systems, it always has different names. Um, and I think that's because there isn't absolute clarity on how you should um, assemble the fields in different contexts. And, and there are very different contexts. So I feel like a set of use cases that said, you know, as um, if I'm trying to construct a name that somebody, uh, a bus stop name that somebody could find on the street, and as they're walking down the street and they want to identify a particular one, it's quite high resolution. It's probably going to need, a, if it's got a stop number or a bus station number, um, peer number, it's going to, we're going to need to know that. You know, that. This is how you should put those fields together to construct that name. Alternatively, it could be its own field. You know, very, very specific. It should be exactly this. Um, or alternatively, I'm on the bus and there's an announcement that comes up, is, is read out to me, tell me what the next stop is. You know, what should that be? It probably shouldn't say um, uh, stand number eight. That's too specific. <laughs> it should probably say certain bus station. And I can think of four, five, six different use cases, at least I'm sure we all can, when the bus stop should be slightly, name should be slightly different. So um, it's quite a long-winded way of, of thinking. When I really think about what's missing, it might be if there were very, very clear rules for consumers of how to construct a name of, in all those different contexts, then I think it would help the creators to say, understand when I when I populate these fields, this is how these my, my bus stop name is going to look at those different contexts. And I think that kind of slight mismatch between the creators doing their best to fill out those fields according to the, the business rules they have and the consumers trying to make sense of the fields that are available to them, that's almost where the, um, the, the possibly the mismatch um, exists and perhaps the, the clarity of those rules for consumers could be it. Uh, I'm aware that, that they things do exist, I just don't think all you're doing it the same way and I don't think it works for all stops. Thank you. I think you've nailed all of the points there. So I, I, I totally agree that there needs to be clarity on how to consume it, which is why I'm talking about the that hierarchy of information. Um, but you've brought up another one that I hadn't even thought of, which is like, um, okay, I'm based in London. I'm sorry I keep on giving London examples. The little round things on top of the buses with the letters on that tells you which which bus stop, if there's multiple bus stops. Those are really important because there'll be three bus stops called the same name, but they've got an A, B, and a C on them. Um, there's also around how we put things in. It's trying to get everyone to agree on ways that work, not just for the very urban environments, but work for the more rural environments as well, that also work for those suburban and or those middling environments. So that every, that there's a standard that, or a standard convention that everyone can adhere to that meets enough people, enough of what people want to do. Um, and that's kind of what I mean by investigating the naming rules and how to avoid a lot of extra work. We don't want you to all have to go and totally change what you're doing because that's not very useful. You've all got far better things to do than rename all of your bus stops. It's also how do we best use the fields and stack them so that people who are consuming the data can understand how those fields are stacked. And that's kind of the bits that we need to look at because those naming rules will also tie up into the business rules and allow us to do some some work around that. Does that make sense to everybody of kind of what we're going to look at? And Dad, uh, David, sorry, does that kind of give you confidence that we're going to head in the right area? Yeah, yes, I, I think it does. And I, I think it might be just formalising those rules would be good because I think the... Um, when somebody looks at stop and it appears to be wrong because it says, um, let's say, um, stand and wait, but Bolton um, bus station in Bolton in Bolton, because these three fields have all been concatenated and it's repeated it. It's kind of like, well, if we were clear that there was a, um, the, the business rules that, that created that name were being followed correctly, then 
it would allow us to possibly the, the nap time to, to migrate to, to be able to respect to create better names from those rules and i think that's one of the things that maybe if there's a bit that's missing it's that it's the that the, all those fields might be correctly populated but when aggregated in ways that seem sensible they don't always come up with good names and i see that tim was also putting up uh nap 10 rules for data managers um that's another one that we've we've looked through and in fact it's one of the ones that i think it's double checking that everything there does still make sense makes sense in in the current practices um and makes sense for everybody and those are the valuable business rules that we should be focusing on um i'm going to drop on to the next one which is about the dft systems so what we did is we presented this lovely little i'm just going to scroll across slightly this lovely little honeycomb map of all the different DFT systems that we think talk to each other. And we wanted to understand how you all um, interact with them and which ones you're most likely to, to use in your various contexts. And what we found is there's a, there's a little cluster around NAPTAN, BODS, real-time information, and I'm calling it CODS, although it's not called that, it's called something else, but it's the coach it's the coach version of BODS. Um, we know that there's a quite a little cluster around those. Um, so what we want to start doing as part of DFT is look at how we can interlink across those systems better, how we can make sure that the data is shared equally and precisely across those systems, that what BODS are taking from NAPTAN they know exactly what they're taking. If we make changes to the naming conventions, they know exactly what fields they should be taking into BODS um, and that they're getting the feeds regularly. All of that is really smooth, but also improve our comms. So we're not coming out and asking you to do something in one system and then five days later asking you to do the complete re reverse in another system. That's not going to be useful. Um, one of the other bits that we found and I'd be interested, we found that almost nobody who's working on buses and bus stops and public transport has in any direct interaction with street manager. So the the interaction with the street manager team, with the team who are digging up streets and doing stuff on the streets, there really isn't a, a direct interaction on that. So one of the things that came up when we spoke to the street manager team was going to be was they were thinking about how do we start to push some of that interaction. So if we're going to dig up a road, we can let the people running the buses know that this road's going to be disrupted for these days at, at, at the state because these people are coming to dig it up. So here's where we're going to have to reroute the buses. Alison, thank you for the love heart. That was really sweet. Obviously, that shows that we're thinking of the right thing. So this is the sort of thing that we want to start thinking about and start planning for and trying to get those communication lines starting to go. Does this make sense to everybody as to what we've what we've uncovered? Did any of this surprise anybody? Jay, just uh, this is Alison here. I hope you can hear me. Hi, Alison. Uh, yeah, I sent a love heart. I've just been dealing with our street works on, on something and realised, you know, whereas when we're putting in new infrastructure and our contractors are, are looking for permits, we would talk about which where the bus stop is and they prefer to know how many yards it is from the nearest, sorry, how many metres, show me age, uh, it is from the nearest side road, which is not something we consider. We we know it by Naptown, we know it by where it, what the bus stop is called and in which direction and street manager, which we now send all our contractors to. Uh, yeah, we don't have that interlink and I think that sounds almost joined up, which is a shock. <laughs> It's it's where we're starting to think, and this is trying to making a NAPTAN that other people can, other people within DFT, other teams within TFT can interact with in a sensible way, um, which you can't quite do with the current NAPTAN. It's not built for that. So yeah, I'm pleased. I'm I'm pleased to get that feedback. Right, next bit. Where are we now? So what I want to run through is where we are now, what's what's going to be coming up and what some plans are and then where we're going to next. 
So where we are now, where coming soon will be some alpha testing. So these people have lost the words that I put in there, but that's okay. Um, these, what we've got is we've, we, we will have invited golden ticket users who will be able to download, go to a new, the new Naptan site and download full, this is all ActoCode's data as a stops.csv via this new journey that some of you might have seen during testing. So data that's uploaded to, to the current Naptan is processed through our system and then you'll be able to access it through some pages and be able to download it. Now, we are trying to think of who would be ideal testers. If you would like to be a golden ticket holder, if you'd like to be one of those first testers of the alpha system and you've got the time to do so. So this is not asking for a ton of time. It's saying, try this, try this for a couple of weeks and let us know your feedback from it. Use it instead of using the current Naptan site. If you're getting your stops.csv or your CSV files and just let us know if this is meeting your needs. Um, that's pretty much what our alpha testing is, and that's coming soon. Where I won't say days away, but we're really close to to having a publicly available site that people that we can start sharing out to people. And then, as we continue on, we're going to keep iterating and making small tweaks to the site, so there'll be things that can be added and added and added. What we're also currently doing, which some of you will have been involved with, is doing some user testing. So we've got consumers and producers of the Naptan data, and we're taking everyone through various prototypes and asking, does this work? So some of the stuff, some of the questions that we're asking is like, do we have the right user journey? Are we thinking about this in the right way? Where you come from, how you would find this information, what information we need to give you to, to make it helpful, especially if you're seeing this for the first time. Now, we know that there's not a lot of first time Naptan users. You've all been using it for so many years. You, you're all familiar with its old ways, its cranky ways, and its odd ways of doing things. We also know that, that, there's, that there are new users to Naptan who must come and look at the site and run away very, very frightened of what they see currently. So what we're trying to do is make the site a little bit easier to read, make it a little bit easier to understand where to go, and a little bit easier to understand what you can do with the data. And then some of the other stuff that we do with user testing is we'll try out some new functionality. So we will think about different ways of doing things and show it to some people and get their feedback. And they will give us feedback and go, mm, 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 sort of, but not quite. And then we go away and we try it again and again and again to see whether or not that functionality is going to be useful. So here we're trying, uh, a, and this is an idea of you can select everything that's in the CSV zip file. You can get just the stop CSV, or you can get, you can choose which of the different files you want. So it's a bit of a pick and mix of CSV files. We're showing this to people just to get an idea of whether or not this will work for you. Alex. Hello, Dr. J. Um, I'm wondering, is this still going to be a public URL where this data can be fetched from? Um, because our requirement is, is to fetch all of the data from one URL if possible. So um, talking back up here in the alpha, with the alpha prototype, we're looking at how that works. And if you're fetching everything from a URL, that's almost like having an API. So what we want to look at is whether people are using the web interface to download and why they're going that way, or whether using the URL to download and how we can support that in a better way yeah. than the cranky pipe filled, got to edit yourself URL. Can we give you an API or something like that that gives you what you want in a much more robust format, in a way that you can double check that everything works, in a way that you can just get the deltas for what's changed today. So that's trying to understand those things. Yeah. Um, when you say API, do you mean something like an XML or a JSON API, or do you mean something where we can still get the stop CSV as it is at the moment? 
that is a technical question, and I'm very definitely not the technical person to answer this. Yeah. Um, I know that APIs come in XMLs and JSONs, um, and I know that that would be a change for people. So yeah. what we need to do is understand what your needs are and have a look at how best we can how best we can fill that. What I don't want to do is break your life and mm. break your workflow too badly. I also need to move you onto a slightly different way of doing things. So onto a new yep. server, and we want to see we how we can best make that work for you, and still keep all the it all robust and all of the other things that we need to do. Does yeah, that help? Um, not really, because at the moment the 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 simplicity of the CSV means that we can just import that straight into a database, and. Mm -hmm. And for us, that's great because it's really straightforward. We're not dealing with APIs, we're not having to set up, you know, network requests for these APIs or any of the code that handles this. We literally grab the CSV file and that gets pushed straight into a database, um, which means we can then use it for um, you know, search engine or for, you know, various places where we need to access that stop. Um, and, and for us, that's going to be much better than trying to access an API or have the, have have us access the API at, at real at run times. You know, so if our uh, we were to switch to using your APIs instead, that that would not be ideal for us. That's that's really good feedback to get. And like I said, we're trying to figure out the best ways of meeting your needs. So mm -hmm. what we'll do is we'll have a look at how to give you that direct link in a way that also allows us to see who's using it because this has been one of the hard parts yeah. not that we want because it's open data one of the hard parts has been trying to figure out who's using the data and what they're using it for and how they're accessing it so that's one of the things that that we're trying to figure out as well does that make sense alex yes that does yeah yeah would you like to be part of the alpha and you don't have to say yes now i'll go on to the other people who've got their hands raised um no, but think I, about yeah, it yes, I would. yeah no i would that would be great thank you excellent i'll sarah's going to make a note and we'll get in contact with you okay rob brilliant. you've got your hand Hi. up yeah um i think i'd agree there with with what alex was saying um in terms of having a single url um that would allow me to download the entire data set either as a CSV or as XML, or, or maybe better still, both options. Um, and then anything that comes in the future with regard to APIs or using the website to find an individual piece of data, that's lovely. Um, but but for system to system communication, yeah, what we what we want, and I think it's the same as what Alex wants, is, is a bulk download of everything um, from a single URL. That would be the best way to move forward. Um, and before you ask, yes, I'd be happy to uh, um, to take part in a sort of alpha version of that as well, just to make sure that um, we can keep downloading the full data set in one go. Fantastic. Um, again, consider yourself added to the list, and and I'll get in. I'll get in touch. Thank you. Um, somebody else had their hand up, and they've disappeared. If you'd like to speak, please speak now. I feel like I'm talking to a Ouija board. Chris. Yeah, I think you've covered it in the last couple of questions. I'm a little bit concerned um, that you hadn't mentioned XML. You've been concentrating very much on CSV. So I've, I've been assuming all along that you will sort of upgrade the quality of data in parallel, um, depending uh, in, so that it's independent of the actual download style. Um, I personally use CSV for download because it can go straight into a database. Um, but I know a couple of other um, outfits that have invested very heavily in getting the XML file in because they find that far quicker mm -hmm. and far simpler as well. So I guess just a little reassurance, you don't just mean CSV would be pertinent at this stage. Is this going to go in parallel, do you know? Yes, so we are going to, so what we're doing is we're putting out the, what we're calling the national, the full NAPTAN as CSV as stops.csv first. Then we'll look at what we do next. And probably the next one will be the XML uh, for, for, for the full data set. And then it's going to be, how do we get you to choose which local authorities you want? And those who have been in user testing will have seen, there's been a couple of different ways that we've looked at how we do 
how do you choose the local authorities that you want to download? And then we'll have a look at how we how we present those. Um, so Chris, it'd be really good to also, if you're not using XML, it'd be good to get a contact for a couple of people who are using XML when we start that that second round of testing, when we release the XML, it'd be really good to get their feedback on what we're releasing, okay. how they're finding it and things like that. Yeah, I'm sure that can be arranged. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, so that's the alpha testing. That's the user testing. Um, and this is more, um, I'm also going to be sending this out as kind of like a comms email of this information because I know that there's people who can't make the public meetings and also may not want to sit through two hours of me talking. So I'm going to summarize it into an email that Adrian and I will send out. Um, so there'll be a comms email of all of this information coming up this week. And then in April, there'll be another comms email with what's come out of the alpha testing. Have people tried it? What if what have the people said? What if they found useful? What if they not found useful? How this has changed our thinking of what we need to provide? Um, the, we're going to then do some uh, public meetings, hopefully uh, after Easter. Well, definitely after Easter. Um, let's talking about I've called it. Let's talk names. Let's talk about naming conventions, how we're stacking the naming conventions, how people are currently using the fields, and trying to understand what the different conventions are and can we group those different conventions and then agree on what's best practice and where it should go because we don't want to force something on you that doesn't make sense to everybody we want to find the best practice and get everyone to agree that this makes sense and this is a good way forward um, and then there's there'll be a plan for the may june public meetings so let me scroll up what's coming up so in the alpha testing, just to be really clear, there's going to be two two big things coming up, more download options. Um, I know that everyone's talked about CSV and, and XML. There's also G, GTFS. Um, we'd be really interested if anyone is using GTFS, if you've got any particular thoughts on GTFS and should we continue to produce GTFS? Um, I might also start doing um, service or screaming, st screaming driven development. Um, we'll put stuff up on the alpha site, but it might not have everything there. So if you don't see something that you need, scream and let us know because we're trying to figure out what people need sometimes by not giving it to you. If we don't give you something, then you'll tell us that you aren't getting what you need. Uh, Dan and then Alex, so Dan first. Yeah, it's just going on GTFS. So uh, to have a GTFS file like the Need Trans Exchange file, obviously NapTans is an important element of that. Uh, but I'm not sure I've got any interest in taking the GTFS just as it stops by itself. I need that to be combined with timetables um, and things like that. So I've got no need for a GTFS stops only file. Oh, thank you for that. That's that's really useful, Alex. Yeah, that's the same for us because uh, we use GTFS for journey planning and uh, we take the trans exchange stops and then we take the NAPTAN stops and we create our own GTFS stops file. Um, so there's no requirement for us to have an export from uh, the DFT for GTFS. Cool. This is really helping because uh, Rob, sorry, I didn't spot you, didn't spot your hand. Exactly the same. Um, no requirement for GTFS from the DFT. Um, uh, we do exactly the same thing. So this is helping us because it's really hard on the current system to tell what's being used. And this is one of the things that we're trying to ensure that we're very aware of. Um, so what we might do is just not have GTFS there or have it grayed out for a bit and find out who starts screaming that they can't get what they're after when we put them on the alpha. Um, there's also going to be how do you download by local authority? Do you want to download a grouping? How best to make it fit your mind? How do we make it easy to choose the local authorities you want to download? We also know that everyone wants to search by 
name by region and also by acto code so how have we come up with the right ways of doing that dan yeah i, I started I had a bit of a look at this the other day uh, it was a dft so a couple of comments i had was uh it'd be good to give regions really important i think for downloading stop data also it'd be good to add a bit of spatial element to it. So what I mean by that is you maybe want a local authority, I'll use Surrey if that's where I live. You want Surrey plus a 10 kilometer boundary or something like that. I'd find that really useful because buses aren't just contained within a local authority. They go outside that local authority. So it'd be good to have some sort of extra feature on top of that where you can download an area plus a specified distance. That's Dan. a really new kind of idea and I really like it. Dan. Oh, Adrian. Dan, Dan, I just wanted to check, when you said regions, would you be able to clarify yeah. um, what you mean by that? Yeah, sure. So like Southwest, uh, East Anglia, Wales, uh, London, uh, something something like that. So, so if, so if you look at, yeah, sorry. I'm going to like, like big areas like counties or so cities as opposed to smaller areas, I guess. So I guess, yes, yeah, so I guess, I guess yeah, like the European regions, I guess is how they've been classified in uh, boundary line in ordnance survey data, so that type of thing. Uh, I, I'd assume counties would be there because they are, they've got their own APCO codes, Surrey is 400 and things like that at the moment. So I'd assume that would continue kind of going forwards as well. That's really helpful. Thank you. Alison. Quick question. You mentioned Surrey, Dan, so I put my ear. I was listening anyway, obviously. I do come from Surrey County Council. And when you're talking regions, I think we would want to go by, um, I don't know if it's feasible, by borough and district with, within us as well, which is very useful. Our NAPTAN convention does link to those. Um, I don't know if that's too much detail. The other question was, um, was the thought was, uh, I might have missed this beginning or previous, uh, is London included in this? Because I know that um, London buses slash TfL have very different naming conventions and coding conventions. Um, yes, London is included. So that's that's one of the complications that we are going to have to figure out when it comes to trying to set up some kind of standard that people like Rob and Dan and, and David can use to stack data is what's London doing and can we get London to do the same as everyone else? Slow moves, glaciers. Good luck with that. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful as always. Um, so coming up under user testing, uh, and the, this is talking about the next couple of months or so, will be how do you upload data into NAPTAN? So we'll start to get in touch with the people who are producers of NAPTAN data, and we'll start looking at how you can upload data, which leads to questions like, how do we let you know that your data got in there? Or why do you want to know if your data got in there? Why do you not trust it? And how do we build that trust? Um, if you're downloading different spaces in different places, or if you're downloading groupings, how do you save those download preferences? What's a way, what are models that are going to work? And this is one and everyone's going to laugh, or people are going to go, why? But it's making the metadata of the data visible. So this is what schema version has somebody provided us? So you can tell what's going on inside the schema, but also possibly some data quality measures. If we run it through this check, how many things failed on that? How many things failed on this check? Um, and those kind of things. So how, how can we kind of get that data to you, to people who are consuming the data or putting in the data in a way that makes sense to everybody? So it's just starting to think about those different things and exploring those different areas. But the download, as, as you saw from the horizons and from the releases, uploading to NAPTAN is kind of the key one. And these other pieces are, are around the edges of that and will be things that we'll explore. We may not release them yet because they will need more exploration. And then for public meetings, trying to set up the idea of a monthly communication email something that means that if we do a big meeting like this there's an outcome from it that's about these different communications um we then there's also two biggish public meetings that we need to run 
first one's on mapping. Um, and I know people smiled when I said mapping before. Do we have a map? Which map should we use? How precise is that map? Does everyone agree that that map works? Does that map work in everyone else's software? We don't want to choose a map that only works on trapeze and doesn't work on mints or anything else and vice versa. We need to make sure that all of these things are possible. We also want to make sure that it's not going to cost a lot for people. Um, and also migration planning. How do we go from using current NAPTAN to new NAPTAN? When, do we, when, when is it good enough that you can start using new NAPTAN? Do we have to have everybody across onto new NAPTAN to turn it off? How do we do that? How do we migrate people? What other stuff is going on in your lives that is going to make that migration timing be difficult? Should we do it all uh, at various points in time throughout the year? Should we migrate various regions first? How are we going to do this? Those are big things that we've got to sit down and plan out. As a service designer, I, I've got to come up with some kind of concept and ideas to take to Adrian as the product owner to go away and go, well, these don't work, these ones do, and how do we how do we move this forward? Does this make sense to everybody? And is this kind of giving you all vision enough of what we've been thinking and where we're kind of going? Right. Things we need. Oh, sorry, Dan, before I move on. It's just a quick thing on, on mapping. I'm not sure that the mapping is necessarily that important. But, uh, I guess for street names and things, you could argue it is. But it's more than location is accurate and uh, more than what mapping is used as part of it in theory. If you know, if you if you do a if you've got a specific coordinates and put onto a map, it should appear in the same location um, on every mapping system, uh, you know. Ah. Should is a really interesting word there. Um, it doesn't, and that's that's the fun. And we know that this happened. Ito World changed where they mapped, and a whole pile of stops appeared to move. So we know that there are differences, even if they're small, between the mapping systems, and that's part of what we need to be super aware of. Um, I, 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 I don't know, I'm not sure. I so I 100% agree with that. I think if you've got a if you're using the OS coordinate system at the moment, that is a set location to a one meter actually you can go more than one meter actually with that now it's how third parties implement and how their systems utilize that coordinate where the issue is but as long as you've got that coordinate set from using os master map data or something like that which is exceptionally accurate then that should be fine it's more the downstream users so again like we said earlier on about implementation downstream that's where maybe advice should be given about you know what what was utilized as part of it uh, and this leads to um, some of the stuff that we've uncovered. So some of you provide Eastings and Northings, and we then have been calculating grid references. Some of you provide grid, grid references, and then we calculate Eastings and Northings from them. Um, and there's a little bit of crosstalk between those. What we want to do is make sure that whatever you're providing, we can map it correctly and it's it's to the right level of accuracy and precision. What we also want to ensure is that if we're having to calculate something for somebody, if we're given a grid reference and we've got to do the Easting Northings, that we're very clear on how that calculation happens and when that calculation happens. And this is what this is why that metadata piece comes in, because if you've got a calculated Eastings and Northings, you, we might have put you slightly in one of the, because it'll be, six or so blocks around the grid where it should be and it doesn't take much to accidentally put you in one of the six around it which means you can be a couple of meters away from where you need to be and that's one of the things that we need we need to be aware of when we're building our calculations but we also want the consumers and to be aware of when they're taking that as to how we've done those fields. Dan, I know that you've got a comment here. <laughs> I think the other thing would be is, okay, you need to specify these business rules about the amount of digits you have after the dot with latitude longitude, because if you get to a certain number, it, I think it's in, one number is three meters actually, I think the next one after that's 0 0.3 meters, you need to specify what the minimum input needs to be um, after the decimal place to ensure you've got that kind of high level of accuracy if you're providing it as a latitude longitude WGS84 uh, file, but yeah. Yeah. 
And um, I think one of the things that came up when we were discussing this in one of the previous public meetings is also the implement you've used to make that measure can also impact that because some things can be precise but not accurate. Um, and it's mapping those two things together so you know exactly that this is the right meter squared and it's spotted it's the right meter spread, it's accurate to that. So it's covering those two pieces off and that's what we're going to do possibly quite a big piece on is, is mapping and making sure that we understand what we're trying to do with mapping. Does that help, Dan? Yeah, that's great, thanks. Sweet. Right. Things we need your help on. Um, contacts for local authorities, who is the responsible person? Now, we know that people like Andy and Tansy are uploading for a large number of local transport authorities. We know that there are people uh, and there are groupings of local transport authorities who get somebody to upload for them. What we want to do is we want to ensure that we've got the right process in place for giving controls out to people, for making sure that we can trace back who's responsible for that data. So that if something is is going on, if something needs changing, we are uh, we can trace back to the right person. We've got all of that traceability. We've also got that authority piece in there of we know who's authorized to go and upload that data. We don't have this, or some of the some of the some of the information we've got for some of the local authorities is really old. We're having to track down some people who we've now found out no longer work for the local transport authority. We're trying to find the right people. So we will be doing over the next couple of weeks slash months, chasing people up to find out who the responsible people are in various local authorities. This is so that we can set up the right kind of processes on our side for giving out and authorizing um, accounts and who should then be able to give an agent an account to go and upload or authorization to go and upload their data. So it's trying to set up the right kind of processes and systems. Um, so if you can get, if you've got ideas on how we should do that, that would be great. If you've got contacts, that would be even better. Um, and hopefully everyone can kind of see why we would need to do this. No screaming, so that's always a good start. Um, the next one is one of the ones of getting those contacts was also going to be getting people involved in user testing. So the user testing takes, I think it's about an hour or so. We're testing on two to three, doing two to three sessions a week, mostly two. So we'll contact people and say, would you be able to come and give us an hour in the next couple of weeks? And we set up a user testing session where we take you through some of the prototypes. We show you some of the new ideas and get your feedback on it. There's not that many users of Naptan. So in, in the normal, well, in the rest of the world, when you're, when you're doing this sort of thing, You've got several thousand people and you can go through and you can grab people who, who who look like this and everything. We know that we've got about 200 users. In fact, it's somewhere between 200 and 220 users. So we are going to be hitting you up a couple of times for user testing. And what we want to do is ensure that our pool of, for user testing is as wide as possible. So it's not just all the people who have turned up here who are constantly being engaged with. We're also getting those those people who might not be able to come to the public meetings or might only be just a little bit involved. Um, but also if you've if you've got, and this is especially for people who are consuming the data, who are downloading the data at the moment, if you've got new people starting at your work, if you've got new people who are starting on a project on Naptan, we would love to talk to them before they get really get a look at the old Naptan or current Naptan so that we can really understand what the experience is like onboarding. I've only onboarded in the last, well, when did I start, Adrian? It was about October. So I've tried to get up to speed on Naptan since October. And I know that it's been a learning curve 
that's been essentially a cliff that I've been climbing. What we want to do is is talk to people who are climbing the Naptan cliff and try and understand how we can make that a little bit more of a learning curve, how we can provide some steps, what sort of information and ideas that we can put out there that's going to make it easier for people to use Naptan data. Because we believe the more people who get into using all these open data systems, the more things that people will be innovative with, the more different ways that people will be able to use this data to get people onto public transport. Um, and then alpha testers. So these will be people that will be pulling in or asking or giving golden tickets to, depending on how you see this, to come and try out the new system for a couple of weeks and give us feedback and just use it and and cope with its different ways of doing things. And that's also going to help us understand what the migration curve is like. Because when you start something, we all know that we've all been through change. We all go through change a lot. You start something and it immediately feels really hard because it's different to what you've always been doing. And then it can take some time to get comfortable with it and feel happy with it. So one of the things that we want our alpha testers to do is to try things for a couple of weeks. It's like putting on a new pair of shoes and having to wear them in a little bit. There'll be rubs and there'll be things that don't quite work. We need to know about those, but we need people to try it for a little bit and go, actually, it was different. But once I got my head around, it, it's different. It was great. That's the sort of thing that we kind of want to be able to understand so we can make some make some changes. Does this make sense to everybody? And does anybody, if you'd like to sign up for any of those, um, please just stick some stickies around them besides them and let us know, especially if you've got contacts for local transport authorities, because that is proving to be slightly more difficult than one could have believed. And the last thing that we're going to do, and we've got about half an hour left, so I'm not doing too badly on time. Um, I'd like you, I'm going to give you 10 minutes, and I know some of you are quite good with using um, Mural, and some of you, this might be your first time using it. Um, there's sticky notes on the second thing down. You can grab little square sticky notes and rectangular sticky notes and make them different colours and do all kind of fun things with them. Um, I'd like you to take 10 minutes and think about how we're engaging with you. What's worked? What, what gives you joy? what frustrates you and how we're communicating and engaging with you and what makes you sad. So I'm just going to put up a thing. I'm going to be quiet for a few minutes. People will be pleased. My throat will be pleased. Um, and just going to give you a few minutes to sit there and put up your thoughts about how we're communicating with you, because we want to make sure that we do this in a way that is really good for everybody and actually makes your time spent on these calls feel really, really valuable. So I'm going to put on a timer. For f I'll do it for five minutes. OK, so what I'm going to do, if it works for everybody, is I'm going to go through and read all the different stickies and try and group them together. If you've got thoughts and you want to say something, just put your hand up and I will. Um, we'll do what we've been doing anyway. You understand how that works. Um, and then I'll go through what gives us joy first, because always start off with the good news. Um, and then we'll talk through what frustrates you and what makes you sad and look at any action points that Adrian and I can look at for going forward and, and how we can communicate. So uh, good regular meetings with interactions. Thank you very much. Taking on board feedback. Thank you. Listening to feedback. Everyone is in the same room. Um, I feel like I've got you all into the same room. I'd love to get you into the same book or maybe even onto the same page, but I think getting everyone into the same room is a good start there. Great opportunity for interaction and engagement. Lots of opportunities for engagement. Industry engagement, data creators and consumers coll collaborating on improvement. Um, I've personally been involved with NAP10 since the inception of Travelline around 20 years ago. This modern app era gives us so many new ways of using the data. Talk of integration with such systems as Street Manager is welcome. And, and those are all the good ones. So thank you very much for that. We really appreciate it. So let's go through and have a look at what frustrates you and what makes you sad and we'll 
from those we'll try to build out action points that we can take and things that we can think about how we change things. So focusing up the top and I'm just going to have to make things a little bit bigger because I can't read the teeny tiny print that this does. Data quality needs to be addressed more quickly. It takes takes time to get projects scheduled with authorities, get people wound up about it well in advance um, when it needs to be done to ensure it is done with the necessary resources. I do understand that that this is like steering a uh, a tanker or something like that, or herding, not quite herding sheep. It's a very slow moving beast that we that we need to move. Um, and I appreciate that we do need to get to data quality um, quicker. I'd love to understand from the person who wrote this or somebody. Um, I'd love to open it for a couple of minutes just to get what data quality issues uh, you're talking about that are your biggest bugbear here? What are the ones that's in the front of your mind when you say data quality at this point? So, okay, we'll we'll come back to that and feel free to contact us with what you think are the biggest data quality problems. Um, then we can start looking at them and, and thinking about how best to tackle them how best to tackle them in terms of what we implement, but also how best to tackle them in terms of what's not working currently to catch them. How do we reach those who are not involved at the moment? Uh, I think that's that's a really good one, and we're going to try a couple of different ways. Uh, if you can share the messages out, if you can share these recordings out amongst people who you know, that would be also be really great. It seems even the DFT do not who is responsible for for NAPTAN and each LA. Um, I'm just a, Adrian. Do you want to say something there, or can I just say, sadly, yes. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not even going to try and argue the point. I mean, we sort of do know. It's just that um, we don't have the actual name for everybody, so I guess that would be that we don't know. So I won't say anymore. <laughs> that was a very Sir 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 Humphrey from Yes Minister argument of well we do know we just don't know. Um, we we are struggling to find the right names there. Um, fear of the unknown. Please don't destroy a working system. Um, I could totally understand that NAPTAN is working. Um, it's not stable and it's not sustainable, and that's why we're having to do to move it. But that's also why we're running both things in parallel. Keith, you're shaking your head when I say it's not stable. Is 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 there some? Is there a bit that I've missed well, here? I, I believe it is stable. It may not be sustainable for everything you want to do in the future, but it's just actually stable. It's been stable for donkey's years. Ah. Uh, there is a, we might be talking about a different stable because I know what's going into keeping it running and, and to keeping it working at the moment. There's a lot of band-aids and duct tape and trying to keep the system working. And that's the bit that we're trying to fix up to so that it's a nice stable running system mm -hmm. and we can stop having to patch the pipes with duct tape, I think would be a relatively... Well, that, that wasn't clear. Understanding of it. Ah. Okay. Does that does that help, Alex? Okay. Um, not yet engaging with the allies responsible for data. We are going to be emailing every email address that we've got to try and 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 get hold of those. The roadmap doesn't appear to be addressing the data quality issues. Actually, I'll sort these into little piles like this. There's a focus on API and user accounts which don't fix any of the issues with NAPTAN. Um, is there any, with this one, if somebody could let me know, are, are the issues with NAPTAN, are these about the data issues or are these about stability issues or is there another issue that we've not been aware of? Hi, Dr. J, that was me that raised that. No, it's the data quality issues. Right. Yeah. Fab, thank you. I'll, I'll put it in with that in my in my little data quality pile. Um, bus companies putting up bus stop flags and including in schedule, but not getting it added into NAPTAN. That's definitely something that we're looking at, and I can totally understand why that would be frustrating. 
operators end up modifying most stop names from NAP10 to display something more user friendly to users. That's a really, really interesting one. And that's something that we want to address in the naming systems. So we're not, we don't just want the local authorities to come along to the discussion about naming. We'd like the consumers of the data, but also some of the bus operators to come along as well, if they're, if possible. Then we can totally understand everyone's viewpoint and find a way forward that, that makes sense to everybody. Because we don't want to be putting a rule in that makes sense that some people just doesn't make sense to them and they'll go do something else. We want to make it that everyone can use the solid gold quality standard data. Uh, changing to stop names could cost thousands. Will there be DFT funding? Um, I'm going to leave that one to Adrian. Uh, and I believe that's part of what <laughs> that's part of what we're going to have to figure out if we do need to go and make lots of name changes. Adrian. Yeah, I, I think over the longer term, there's lots of things that we might, you know, we, we, we like to do or need to think about doing. I think the sessions that Dr. J is going to organise to talk about consistency of naming terms will, will perhaps point us in certain directions. And then we need to look at how how do we organise ourselves to make the changes. Um, so still a question mark at the moment. But yeah, we, we, we are well aware that any any changes that we do could have cost implications for people and not intending to do anything that is unreasonable. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, possible need to differentiate better between uploaders and downloaders of NAP10 rather than mixing the relevant parts together. Um, we're trying to differentiate people more as producers and consumers of data now because we tried doing it around the functions of uploading and downloading and what we uncovered was a lot of people who produce the data also need to download the data to for neighboring areas and for where stuff crosses boundaries and things like that so we're we're now starting to split it between the people whose primary function is the production of nap10 data and whose primary function is the consumption of nap10 data so hopefully this helps make a little bit more sense of that and we're going to try and update all the little diagrams and everything to kind of reflect that change in thinking does this help with that one a little bit hopefully it does um how data quality is being addressed and maintained. The LTA stop owners are managed well regionally in most cases. Direct DFT involvement could cause confusion. Um, totally understand. And what we're trying to do is set up a process so that if somebody is given access rights to upload for a region, we also understand who we should go and talk to about the production of that data or the um, the local situation around that data. That's all that we're trying to do. We're not trying to step in the way of and intervene in any way in what is happening currently. We don't want to break your flow. We do not want to break your flow. Does that make sense? And I know that's possibly either Tansy or Andy who've put in that one and please feel free to contact me and talk it through because I don't want to mess up your lives and make it much harder for you. Uh, uh, need to look at the current errors for LAs reported in ETO and make sure that they are resolved too. Um, this is around data quality and, and I believe this is looking at how ETO world and the business rules that ETO World is using. And part of it for me is trying to understand is the ETO World rules the right rules and are they valuable rules to be putting in? Or are they rules that are causing a little bit of kerfuffle and churn around bearings and things like that? So just trying to understand which of those current errors should be fixed before we move on. Um, losing access to a single CSV file. Don't quite get this one, but if somebody could explain this to me and help me understand, that would be amazing. I raised that one, sorry. I was trying to um, understand earlier about where we talked about um, that there was going to be an API involved. 
Right. And I've put this here because at the moment it doesn't appear to be, or the, the CSV download doesn't appear to be mentioned anywhere, so I put it here. Ah, so, th so let me just run, Alex, if you want to stay for 10 minutes afterwards, I'll run back and take you through what we're working on currently, and okay. hopefully that will answer your questions if that's okay. Yeah, no, I, I don't want to sound like a teacher asking you to stay back for 10 minutes, but if anyone wants to stay back for 10 minutes afterwards, I'll run through what we're doing currently, and hopefully that will help you understand a little more of what's going on. Um, who's the best generic point of contact? Uh, I'm going to come to that in a moment, so we'll run through that. Every transport system I use has a different name for a stop, and I think that comes up under the data quality. So I will put that up here under data quality. And yes, that is one of the things that we're very aware of. Um, talking about apps and APIs as the Nirvana, in 10 years time, will we even be using them? Future proofing is required. I totally understand. And that's one of the reasons of fixing the piping, um, fixing going to the new NAT10 infrastructure and ways of doing things so that we can future-proof ourselves. When new technology comes out, when new ways of thinking about using this data come out, um, we want to be able to take them on really, really quickly. The current NAP10 I don't think has been able to be updated for a number of years. Uh, um, so running through what makes you sad. Uh, seems to be a way until we get anything different to what we have at the moment. Yeah, I'm sorry about that too. Um, there's not a lot. We need to build the current system to be able to make it better. So we've, we can't build on the current system. It's too broken. So we're having to remake it so that we can then start to make better things on it. Hopefully we can make improvements as we start to remake it. And that's some of the stuff that we're starting to look at in the testing. So um, if you want to get involved in the testing, you'll get an idea of, of those new things that we're thinking of and be able to give us some of those really good ideas. The roadmap seems too long until we actually end up where we want to be. Um, I'm assuming this is the 25, 2025. It's a good thing I didn't write 2525. Um, 2025 kind of vision. If we can keep up the pace that we're doing, hopefully we'll be able to bring a lot more back into Horizon 2 and into some of the more releases coming through and we can start talking about the different releases as they come through. Um, if there's any thoughts on that, it'd be really good to get them put onto the roadmap. What stuff do you think should be coming in earlier? Because if you can tell us the stuff that's really important to you that you'd really like to get there, we can start to focus on those and start to get those things across. How long will this take before the customer may see benefit? Um, if the customer is you in terms of being able to get data out of the system that's of decent quality, that's checked and all of those things, that's in a schema other than 2.1, hopefully MVP, well, no, actually just after the MVP, because we can start to put out some 2.4, if somebody is giving us 2.4 XML, we can give you 2.4 XML. So that's kind of a little bit of a benefit already that we can get out of the very first things that we start, or well, the second things that we start to release. So we can actually start to move a little bit more towards a slightly better system. Um, Why do customer benefit might take a little bit longer? It always does. But hopefully these little incremental improvements will start to build up. People thinking we can change a system overnight. There are many downstream systems which rely on the current system. Absolutely. Totally understand. And that's why we want to ensure that everybody's involved and understanding what changes are going to be coming, but also that both systems are running in parallel for as long as possible. The business rules for data creator are defined, but rules for how data consumers should use NAP10, e.g. aggregating fields when creating bus stop names suitable for different contexts or not. I think that's a really, really good point. That's a great point, and that's something that we'll definitely take into the whole naming convention piece, but also the whole business rules piece. 
Excellent. So there's about 15 minutes left, so we might actually end up finishing a few minutes before the end of time. Um, this is the context for us. So for me, it's pretty much anything to do with these meetings. Um, if you want to get involved in testing or anything like that, you can come through through me. I'm just j.harrison at dft.gov.uk. Adrian is anything for the rebuilt NAPTAN project slash service. And Ursuline um, via the current naptan.nubtig at DFT um, for the rebuilt system that goes through to the help desk or for the current system, sorry. Um, does anyone not have those contact details? Hopefully there are three contact details that you've all had a couple of couple of times before. And you'll all also get an email from me and Adrian in the next day or so. Um, so thank you everyone for your time, for your patience, for your input. I really, really appreciate the the energy that you're putting into this because it's really making it easy to try and figure out where we should go. If it wasn't for you putting in this energy, we'd just be sitting there going, eh, we should change something somewhere, I suppose, and probably doing things that aren't going to be really useful to you. So it's really great that you're coming along to these and letting us know what you think. Um, does anyone have anything else? Debbie? Hi, um, and I'm, I think the token Scottish person here, and I think my, my question is, is Scotland covered in this? Yes, it is. Are you from Argyll and Butel or Midlothian by any no, chance? No, I'm, I'm from Transport Scotland, so I'm very interested to see how it's, it's going to come together. I'm very interested in contacting you because we can't find Midlothian or Argyll and Butte. <laughs> well, I know where they are on a map. Now I've uncovered them on a map. We're just trying to find the right contacts. So, yes, um, I will drop you a line, Debbie. But Perfect. Yes. Thank you. But Scotland is covered, which is good news. Scotland mm -hmm. is definitely covered. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Andy. Andy. Um, Andy I, hi. Uh, I'm covering Argyll and Butte. As in there in our oh, data set now, five high trans yes. areas are, are, are through me now. So I, I can give you the contact for the person that actually does the data. But uh, yeah, oh. we're, we're supporting them. Oh, that would be amazing because we couldn't find them being updated for ages. So we were wondering how they were doing it or if they were doing it. So it's really good to know. Thank you so much. Um, so if there's nothing else, uh, I was going to stay and talk to Alex about what's going on currently and talk about what we're doing with CSV files. Um, if anyone else wants to stay and listen to me blather on for another 10 minutes, or you can go and have 10 minutes free of meetings in your life. <laughs>